Part one, a product of the state, a brief family history. My given name is Joseph George Sullivan. My confirmation name is John. Named such in March 1939 in Rockaway Beach, Irish town, Queens. Third generation Irish American and second eldest of six children, four boys and two girls. I was named such an honor of my father's brother, Joe, who died four years before my birth at the young age of 21. Uncle Joe was literally the shining star of the staunch Irish Catholic Sullivan family from Bell Harbor, New York. Uncle Joe was doted on by his mother and father and worshiped by his five brothers and two sisters who he led the way for and was very defensive of at a time when there was still a good deal of wasp prejudice against Irish Catholics. Signs such as Irish need not apply and Irish keep off the grass were still a common sight. None adored Uncle Joe more than my dad, nor was more devastated upon his untimely death. Word up. One thing about this book is that uh, this is one thing that got me was Sullivan is a fucking damn good writer, which is... Pr- which is pretty crazy, right? Um, Maybe it's not. The exception, of course, being his mom, Julia McLaughlin Sullivan, and my grandma and my grandfather, Big Tim Sullivan, who had all said died, who, excuse me, let me start that over. Um, Signs such as Irish need not apply and Irish keep off the grass were all still a common sight. None adored Uncle Joe more than my dad, nor was more devastated upon his untimely death. The exception, of course, being his mom, Julia McLaughlin Sullivan, and my grandfather, Big Tim Sullivan, who all said died of a broken heart within a year of Joe's passing. Big Tim, as all called him, had been the New York City handball champion while serving as captain on the police force for over 20 years. Uncle Joe was a strapping six foot two, drop dead handsome left tackle for the fighting Irish of Notre Dame at South Bend, Indiana. He planned to go into the monastery upon graduation in his senior year of 1935 and had just been voted co-captain at the start of the 35 season, his final year under head coach Elmer Layden, one of the heralded four horsemen of the Newt Rockne era. When suddenly, In the bone-chilling cold of a South Bend, Indiana winter, Joe contracted pneumonia and died a very short few days later. Some of his family say his death was due to to a head injury in that era of leather helmet football. Uncle Joe's greatest battles on the gridiron were against Army and Navy as two of his younger brothers, Frank and Eddie, played for Navy and Army in Joe's third year at Notre Dame. As a wide-eyed eight-year-old in my grandmother's house in Bell Harbor, New York, I heard all the loving stories and thought I was in a museum dedicated to his memory. His presence was everywhere, in the pictures, medals and trophies for football, javelin and the shot put, and of course, in the news clippings, which I read with the young boys all. Though my most sacred moments came whenever I snuck down into the basement, silently undoing the huge brass clamps of a steamer trunk, which held all my Uncle Joe's football paraphernalia, before which I'd sit for hours on the damp basement floor, holding and fingering the muddy, high-topped cleats, blood-stained jersey, and battered leather helmet in my trembling hands. All the while, listening for footsteps on the cellar doors, for it was taboo and unspoken agreement that the trunk was never to be opened, or those holy relics ever touched again. But something I had been doing every week since the age of eight, hearing the Notre Dame fight song in my fertile mind and heart and visualizing myself one day running out onto the same field in the shadow of the Golden Dome to finish where Uncle Joe had left off. 
Those were my most memorable moments as a child. I remember when dad and mom and my brothers and sisters would all get into the Green Hornet, a beat up old Hudson, and take a 15 mile ride for our ritual Sunday dinner at grandma's house. I think grandma favored me just a bit, being her first grandson and named after Uncle Joe to boot. One particular Sunday without a saying, without saying a word, she handed me a book written about four athletes titled All Stars of Christ by a priest from South Bend, Indiana. To the shock of all my aunts and uncles, they never spoke about Uncle Joe around her. The book went far beyond his athletic prowess and spoke of his genteel decency as a God-fearing man. But it was the author's opening statement I have carried in my heart. Quote, the Irish are running out onto the field, 1935 verse Army in Yankee Stadium. But a glum silence has come over the crowd for number 79, Big Joe Sullivan is not there. While I have failed miserably and disgraced this tragic legacy of my youth long ago by falling into the same murky pit of self-pity and despair that destroyed that too proud generation of Sullivans before me, and for which I shall not seek redemption through my sons. They shall not be burdened by the ghosts of the past, no matter how impure nor the terrible sins of their father. For the chain must be broken. What follows is not, let me check the uh, levels here. Check, 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 we're peaking. Check, 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 check. Sorry guys, let me just check, check, much better. Bring it down. All right, hopefully you guys hear me all right. Let's get back to it. I shall, mm -hmm. all right. While I have failed miserably and disgraced this tragic legacy of my youth long ago by falling into that same murky pit of despair that destroyed that too proud generation of Sullivans before me, and for which I shall not seek redemption through my sons, they shall not be burdened by the ghosts of the past, no matter how impure nor the terrible sins of their father, for the chain must be broken. What follows is not the man I plan to be, but an agonizingly slow chronological metamorphosis of an aberration I've somehow allowed myself to become. The good, bad, and downright ugly. I think the two most influential people in my life were the uncle I never knew and my father, whom I needed to believe I did know. Although my dad died when I was only 13, it was to him I whispered in the darkness of my cell where God does not live for strength and support in face of the physical and moral degradation that could easily become the daily fare of a young prisoner who contemplates the luxury of self-pity or weakness in any form. He did not always answer me, but I always felt his presence. And though I know he frowned upon the actions that led me to be incarcerated, he never deserted me. So I tried to carry myself as a gentleman and respond to intimidation and immorality in the manner I distinctively felt he would expect of me. He was bigger than life in my young boy's eye, <clears throat> even in death. And 40 years later, he has not diminished one iota. I just had the true essence of his values asked backwards all these years. When you're the anvil, you must bear when you're the hammer, strike. Attica, 9 April, 1971. As I lay in the coal pile before trying to escape and scale the high gray wall of Attica prison, focusing clearly upon the menacing turreted tower above me, my entire senseless life seemed to race through my mind as I contemplated whether the faceless watchdog inside was to be my executioner. I had looked at many walls before but this one seemed to have no top. I wondered how many years these mechanical men, this particular bird, had been perched in his nest up there, just waiting for a chance to kill someone, anyone. Did they really have those 
new AR-15s up there, I understood that even if they hit you in an arm or leg, the shock impact alone could shatter your nervous system and kill you. I derived some comfort telling myself that these guys probably had very little practice and were lousy shots. But deep inside, I knew that all these country boys could knock the sweat off a gnat's ass of seeing at a seen distance. My throat was dry and the pains in my stomach nearly doubled me over. I turned my eyes to the storehouse platform 70 yards away and stared at the man standing there, almost rigid with the street sweeper type of broom clenched in his hands. Excuse me, clenched in my hands. Mike, my friend, the poor bastard, was more anxious and frightened for me than I was for myself. I knew this from the conversation we had the day before as we paced back and forth on the gravel-packed driveway just outside the entrance of the storehouse and garage. He was so sincere in his attempt to discourage me, continually bringing up all the bad points concerning the escape that it was beginning to unnerve me. I knew he was right, but I couldn't allow myself to listen to it. Shut up, for Christ's sake, shut up! Don't you think by now I should know what the chances are? He fell silent, and then seconds later muttered, I know, Sully, but goddamn, there's got to be something better than this shit. He whispered fiercely, shaking his head, This shit's impossible. The solemn seriousness on his face and his choking words moved me deeply, and I couldn't help but throw my arm around his neck and hug him, laughing and trying to swallow the tears I felt welling within me. These hard, supposedly insensitive men are all I have known in the last 17 years of my life, and the exception of about five short-lived months as a free man. To this day, I have never found an inmate who was insensitive. On the contrary, beneath their sullen-like facade, they are very emotional men, oversensitive, to the point that they cannot allow themselves to be deceived by the falseness and inhumane treacheries and inconsistencies of the outside civilized world. And I would not trade the loyalty I have known with these men for the life of any Sunday good guy, for we all are the same people, for better or worse, seven days a week. Listen, Mike, I said, smiling foolishly, and he standing there looking stupid, I know this whole thing is shit, and I gag on the smell of it myself, we both laughed. I also know that in any other place, under other conditions or circumstances, it would be impossible. But this is Attica. Remember that. This is Attica, the modern-day Devil's Island. One of the few escape-proof bastions left in the United States, right? I smiled. Yeah, well, but what does the... It has everything to do with it, Mike. You were right when you said that there's got to be a better way. There is, but nobody's ever found it. How long has this fucking joint been standing here? I don't know, 30, 40 years, I guess. Yeah, something like that. But how many of you guys heard of that, of that tried this joint? I mean, really tried. Not some joker scratching on steel bars with a nail clipper. To be honest, I ain't heard of none. He raised his hands in mock defeat, still grinning like a moron. Neither have I, and neither has Willie, and he's been here 17 years. You mean Sutton? Yeah. I used to rap with him almost every day in the afternoon when I worked in the laundry. What'd you rap about? I mean, everything, Mike. This guy's a really beautiful person from the old school, know what I mean? So he's talking about Willie Sutton, the gentleman gangster something he escaped he was known for being a great escape artist from he escaped from more than one prison i think and so that's who joe sullivan got the inspiration to escape from uh attica prison from so i continue yeah but would he really open up and talk personally with you i know where you're coming from and i was a little awed at first but he's just a man like you and me understand there was no holier-than-thou attitude or phony airs. It was just casual at the beginning. When he sensed he could trust me, we spoke about a lot of things. I should say he spoke and I listened. We both laughed. And believe me, listening to Willie talk is like getting a history lesson firsthand. He took me back to the 20s and 30s, the prohibition with Waxy Gordon, Dutch Schultz, 
and all that. I really felt like the guy was my father, the way he schooled me against the use of unnecessary violence. Damn, when I ran down the crime I was convicted of to him, he only looked at me condescendingly and shook his head sadly. It actually hurt him to think that I could have been so uncompassionate. You serious, Sully? Mike asked in jest, but really disbelieving. I'm dead serious, Mike. Of course, when he was young, he was a wild son of a bitch, but back then, so was everyone. They were thieves and stick-up men, but all they wanted was a dude's money, not his fucking life. Yeah, he sighed. But dig, if Sutton was as smart as they say, how, how come he never got out of here? He ain't even tried. Why not? He had a million fucking years, he snorted. Yeah, Mike, I mimicked him heatedly. He had a million fucking years. He also had a guard to watch him eat, shit, and breathe 24 hours a day for the first six years he was here. And even till the day he left, he couldn't take 10 fucking steps in any direction without some moron doing his duty in guarding a 63-year-old man from escaping. They made him work in the laundry for 17 years, which in itself is no more than a big cell. You're locked in and out on every movement. Shit, Sully. You'd think when a man got that old, they'd ease up on him, especially after they put that tube in his chest. They gotta be some cold-blooded cocksuckers, huh? Listen, Mike, this whole joint is a bullshit myth built on 17 years of one man of one poor bastard's misery and heartache. A man who was unfortunate enough to become the wrong kind of legend in an extremely unpopular profession. The means may have appeared to be subtle, but they were all callously designed to break one man, to strip him of the small shreds of dignity he so consciously struggled to preserve. They couldn't do it, Mike. And though his body has wilted with age, that glint of fierce pride and boyish devilishness has never left his eyes. Listen, Sully, I can understand how you feel about the guy, but how do you figure any of this is going to help you over that wall? He nodded his head toward the awesome wall, which I no longer care to look at. I would see enough of it tomorrow. I didn't say anything was going to help me. I've just been trying to show you how this administration from top to bottom has become over the period of 17 years. It's its own greatest fan and believer in the myth that they themselves have built for us. This is why I believe it can be done. I may be a fool in many ways, but I harbor no suicidal tendencies whatsoever. I'm beginning to wonder, you nut, he smiled. Another thing, Mike. These people are great believers at the pattern process that most criminals follow throughout their lives, which I agree is true to a degree. But who doesn't live in a certain type of schedule? Excuse me. But who doesn't live by a certain type of schedule? Who sets a clearer and more vivid pattern of movement and habits than these people? They're like goddamn robots. You watch them with me. Lenny, too. You could set up a watch according to how many times they scratch their ass. Yeah, Mike said, unconvincingly. But just suppose that tomorrow their assholes aren't itchy and don't need no scratching. Then what? He asked smugly. Then my ass will get, then my ass will be scratched, you dirty bastard, I smiled. Listen. All I need to get over is 12, maybe 15 seconds at most. And when a truck comes through that back gate, these cops and them towers are so elated over any interruption that they follow its path like some dirty old man going after some young filly till she's out of sight. But only till the next one comes along. This is the chance I've got to take. I've got to try. If I don't, then I belong here. You know what I mean? I don't ever want to be just another head in the herd, a piece of meat to go on a count a dozen times a day. To tell the truth, I don't even know what I'm, what I'm escaping to, where I will go, or what I will do. 
but I do know what I'm escaping from. We are living in a graveyard of Enoch's. We are looked upon as one would look upon a dung of heap, but in reality, even less, because these farmers can find means of utilizing a good dung heap. Do you wonder why I feel this place can be had? Well, it's just for this very reason. Since these people stand in awe of this well-renowned fortress and cannot conceive the thought of a possible escape, were they themselves in this position, ego-wise, it is only natural that they have come to believe that everyone possesses the same lack of courage, especially common criminals such as ourselves. But enough of that crap. Is everything ready? Oh, shit. I'm ready to break free. Proceeding. Yeah, Johnny brought over. <laughs> yeah, Johnny brought over those other lengths of foot length pipe this morning. Were they all threaded on both ends? Did you check all of them? How many are in the bag? Of course, I checked all of them. There are 32 lengths with all the couplings attached, along with other pipes and elbows for the hook. Why so much depth in the hook, Joe? It's too clumsy to handle. I know it's clumsy, but the top of the wall isn't flat. It's rounded off and designed to throw off a hook like this one if any weight is applied to it. With this, the gripping prongs are long enough so even when my whole weight is on the pipe and it slides, it'll still grip the wall. Right. But how about the scraping sounds? He's bound to hear them. I got quite a bit of tape from the hospital. I'll wrap some sh strips of the sheet around it first before I tape it. How much do you think will make contact with the wall, Mike? I asked. Shit, I don't know, he laughed. I'm no authority on these types of actions, Joe. How much do you think? Psh, I'm not sure either, Haas. Last time I went over a wall was in Jersey, and we used a ladder for that. This will be the first time I have to resort to such a primitive means to deliver myself, or should I say, abscond from within a restricted premise. Stop, for Christ's sake. I'm trying to be patient with this lunacy. Now, how much do you think should be taped? Be serious, Joe. He was serious. I'm sorry, Mike. But really, how can I be sure how much makes contact? <laughs> it all depends on how much the hook slides. I hope it doesn't slide too much because neither the elbows nor the couplings could take the pressure of such an angle even if I'm climbing fluidly without jerking on it. I figure I'll wrap the tape both top and bottom six feet and the rest shouldn't hit at all naturally. How much money you got together? About 70 bucks, counting the 20 you got yesterday. It ain't much to go on, Joe. I wish we could have got more. It's enough to go on if I make it. If I don't, it wouldn't matter how much I had, would it? No, nah, I guess not. I hope Lenny can get that pipe off the wall once you're over. You need time, Mike said worriedly. If there's any way he can get it, he will. Don't worry. But I told him I don't want him making a move unless there's no reaction at all. He should be able to tell within three or four seconds after I'm out. He must move within that time or forget it. If he does get, get it down... He knows what to do with it. All right, let's suppose he gets it down. You still have, you still won't have much time. If they don't find you missing before we go back to the cells for lunch, you've got two hours at best. You can't even drive a fucking car and you're in the middle of the country. What then? First of all, genius, if I walk around that parking lot, I'm going to have a lot more than two hours. Willie Sutton told me that sometime back, maybe six to eight years, the count came up short. Everybody was kept locked in and the search began. About nine or ten hours later, they found this nut inside a garbage can in the back of the hospital. The guy wasn't even trying to escape. He was a bug. So? What do you mean, so? Don't get so shitty all the time. 
Here's a guy missing for almost 10 hours and no alert was put out at all. Why? Because these people are so sure it can't be done. If they waited 10 hours and still didn't cover this institution in their search, how much longer would they have waited? No tell There's no telling. But I'd probably have enough time to walk clear out of New York State. You better get clear out of the state because if you're caught anywhere in the immediate vicinity around here, there's no giving up, Joe. They'll whack you for sure. I know. I'm well aware of how they think, Mike. There's the stick. At that time, convicts in marching formation moved and stopped at the sound of nightsticks wrapped on the ground or concrete wall. It's time for chow. And if there ain't no trucks to unload, I'll catch you, Lenny and Mac, out back this afternoon. I want to go over this completely one more time, okay? Let them come out after 2 o'clock, a few minutes apart. Oh, well, let's go eat, my friend. If I can, he smiled, curling up his lip in mock-like disgust. I've yet to see the day you couldn't eat, you buzzard. Fuck you, Sully. April 9th, 1971, 9.05 a.m. The sweat burned and stung my eyes as I worked on the pipes furiously but methodically, screwing the short lengths together and tightening them as much as the strength in my hands would allow, then padding and taping, easing its long length from under the railroad track, whose construction offered me temporary asylum from my enemy above. The sweat turned cold on my chest and back now that I had finally finished my main task. Kneeling on both knees, I extended my left hand, gripping the pipe tightly as far, as, as far up as I could without losing any leverage. I gripped the base with my right pushing down, pulling slowly but steadily on my left. It was heavy and bent to some degree in the middle, but it would be all right, I hoped. I lay back against the coal pipe, excuse me, I lay back against the coal pile, daring to close my eyes for a few precious seconds. The giant steel gate took almost 10 seconds to slide back completely before any vehicle could move through. I was electronically controlled, excuse me, it was electronically controlled. I opened my eyes again quickly and remembering where I was, looking at my watch, it was only 9.13, only 13 minutes I've been lying here. I feel like I was born here. Why am I doing this? What is the sense in it? How many times have you waited like this before? You don't have to do this. What are you trying to prove? To who? It's not too late to turn back. They'll understand. Why should I care if they understand? They wouldn't anyway. Damn, I feel so tired, so alone, so, so sleepy. 1952, <clears throat> 13 years old. Joseph, come in the house. You have to get dressed. Your father just died. What? Aunt Seal? I asked, numb with disbelief, not really understanding nor wanting to believe that I had, what I had understood, just this code, excuse me, what? Aunt Seal, I asked, numb with disbelief, not really understanding nor wanting to believe that I had understood just what this cold-blooded bitch of an aunt was so casually saying to me. After all, I was 13 years old and should have been able to accept such things, right? I approached the screen door, which she was standing behind. God, I hated to look into that terrible face with its cold, beady eyes and thin, bloodless lips. I knew, even at that young age, that she hated men and hated me. It was something I could feel, even in her slightest glance. I was seething now. I felt terribly hurt and empty because she was saying something I knew was bad, but couldn't really grasp the meaning of. What did you say, Aunt Seal? I asked shakily, tears. I can still taste running into my mouth. I asked her very nicely, very politely, 
barely in control, hoping I had misunderstood her. I said, she replied in that imperious tone, your father is dead. And, oh, you bitch, you dirty bitch. Out came the, ke the keening wail of the wounded animal within me. Slamming the basketball against the screen portion of the door, she peered through, almost breaking her nose. Oof. And I was still wailing uncontrollably on the grass. When my father's brother, John, came into the backyard. What did you tell him, Seal? He asked softly, barely controlling his anger. I told him his father was dead. That's all. She snapped indi indignantly, yet staring aghast at my venom-filled face. That's all, you said? Just like that? Why? Yes, yes, I go upstairs now, Uncle John growled, and she scurried away like some indignant rodent. Come on inside, Joe. Uncle John said in that firm but gentle way he had, I'm sorry about this. I wanted to talk to you first, but is it true what she said, Uncle John? I sobbed, still hoping it was all a mistake. Yes, Joe. Your dad, my brother, passed away early this morning, and I miss him very, very much, just as I know you will. I knew he meant well, but what was there to be understood? I was young, selfish, and above all, felt terribly cheated by some cruel hoax. My father was my young superhero. Excuse me. My father was my hero, young, handsome, strong. He was Superman. How could Superman die? Never knowing or caring that there were others who felt this loss as much as I. My father, at the time of his death, was a decorated first grade detective in Brooklyn's 79th precinct. He was a 16-year veteran and just 36 years old. But my mother never received a pension in spite of being left with six kids because he was a few years short of eligibility, despite the fact that his ulcer problems were job-related. So much for we look out for ours. My beautiful mother, who I had always felt was strong in so many ways, and she was, sought her own escape and eventual destruction by turning to alcohol. The only weakness she had, I know this now, was her love for my father. She did not want to live without him. 1952, you killed him. Shortly after the funeral, Uncle John and Aunt Seal took me to live with them to ease my mother's burden since I was one of six children. But Uncle John saw that Aunt Seal did not know how to treat or handle a boy, having raised two girls with an iron fist in her domineering, man-hating manner. Mary. The older daughter went into a convent a few years later, and Claire, the tomboy, attended an all-girls Catholic high school, was forbidden to accept even the most innocent of dates, and was not even allowed to go to the movies on a Saturday afternoon. The real conflict began when after school, she would not allow me the freedom or free time to play stickball, punch ball, or engage in the activities boys do once they run home from school and change their clothes. She demanded I look prim and proper, like little Lord Fauntleroy, and that I accompany her and the girls everywhere, shopping and all the tea and crumpet parties. <laughs> I was bursting with indignant indignation inside, and besides trying to put an internal skirt on me, she was a religious freak to the point of it being a mental illness. I understood why Uncle John would come off the train from work in the evenings and not stop, excuse me, and stop in the corner bar and drink beer with the guys whom he had nothing in common with and didn't arrive home till the evenings when everyone, particularly Aunt Seal, were asleep. He had to be a saint to live in that house, where not only Aunt Seal but also his own daughters whom Seal had turned against him were cold and indifferent in his presence, but he just went his way quietly. My final act of rebellion came when the bitch, as I came to think of her, chirped chapel time each evening in her pseudo-sweet voice, 
a call I had come to dread and even have nightmares about. Aunt Seal had converted a spare room upstairs into a little chapel of sorts, with statues of all the saints and religious artifacts hanging from all the walls but one, which was reserved solely for a huge cross I could have nailed a midget on. The floor was bare <clears throat> and highly polished wood planking. It was on that floor the four of us would kneel, babbling in prayer while fingering our rosary beads from six till nine o'clock every night after our homework was done. We needed to beg for forgiveness for all our real and imagined sins we were committed, we had committed during the course of the day. After months of kneeling in excruciating pain, praying and mumbling incoherently to two chunks of wood on a wall, rebellion began to set in. One night, Aunt Seal noticed I wasn't grimacing in deserved agony as I usually did. Stand up and pull your pants down, Joseph. She stood and demanded it in self-righteous anger, while both girls turned their heads to glare at me with some knee-jerk inbred hatred. Uh, what's wrong? I retorted angrily. You're cheating the Lord, Joseph, the bitch hissed. Without pain, you cannot feel the cleansing of your soul. Aw, Aunt Seal, I whined. Put your pants down, Joseph, she demanded, stepping towards me in a threatening manner. Okay, okay, I said wickedly, lowering my pants that exposed the strips of bath towels I had wrapped around my bruised and swollen knees. Cheater, cheater, cheater! The three hate-filled faces chanted in a chorus, a wailing ritual they must have admonished each other with for years. And it was at that very moment I realized they were all crazy in some way, and I couldn't quite understand what it was, but I did understand I'd had enough and began to walk from the room when Aunt Seal's bloody scream froze me in both fear and anger. Where do you think you're going? Come back here this instant and kneel down. No, I ain't kneeling no more. It hurts, I quivered. What did you say? What did you say, Joseph? All the months of emotion exploded inside me. I said, fuck you, Aunt Seal. Fuck you. Fuck you. I screamed as Cousin Claire, a big girl, and as demented as her mother, hopped to her feet and started after me, upon which I took flight, flying down the stairs and into the living room where I was trapped. I immediately grasped an iron poker from the fireplace and I turned to meet my demonic attacker. Come on, you bitch, I'll split your head open. Come on, I screamed, all of you. Claire, don't go near him, the bitch called from where she and Mary stood, looking over the staircase banister. Move away from him. Can't you see he's mentally disturbed? Those venomous words, which for some reason, those venomous words, which for some reason, that's a lot. Okay. Uh, we'll come back. Um, move away from him. Can't you see he's mentally disturbed? Those venomous words, which for some reason caused me to laugh and cry simultaneously after they had withdrawn to the safety of their godless chapel. chapel. When Uncle John came home, I told him everything that had happened. The monsters were upstairs sleeping peacefully as if nothing unusual had taken place. I'm sorry, Joe. Uncle John shook his head sadly, hugging me close to him. I had hoped your living here would somehow work out. I should have known better but I think for everybody's sake, it would be best if you moved back with your mother. I understand Uncle John. He was a great guy, but he had no control of his own home and had long ago lost his will and energy to try. My first impression upon moving home was that I had ascended from hell into heaven, but I soon found that our fatherless home had become a purgatory somewhere between heaven and hell. My mother had fallen into that well of alcohol that inspires self-pity and defeat when she should have been strong and kept our ship afloat. 
if on, only a memory of her husband, which our presence should have represented to her. Instead, like Aunt Seal, she had become another nightmare, at least for me, being the oldest of four sons and two daughters at 13 years of age. The first night home, I was awakened from my sleep at about 10 o'clock. What's wrong, Ma? I thought I was dreaming. Put your clothes on and come downstairs, she hiccuped drunkenly. When I went down into the semi-darkened living room, Mom was pouring a glass of beer from a quart bottle of, of Pell's and staring at the TV screen that emitted no sound. I stood before her with confused, quiet obedience. I want you to go around to the willow, she spoke in a slurred voice. She was speaking of the willow bar and grill around the corner on Atlantic Avenue. They have some money. Your father's friends have taken up a collection for us. Bring it back. Money? Who should I ask, Mom? Anyone. Ask anyone, she snapped. Please, Mom, we don't need it. Don't take it from them. Somehow, even then, I knew it was a humiliating thing, especially for my mother. Don't you question me, she screamed. Just do as I tell you. Now go. All right, Mom. I sniffled, slinking out into the dark night, shivering from the cold as I ran around the corner. There was nobody on the street, and only a few cars moved along Atlantic Avenue as I stood on my toes to peer into the bar. There were only about 10 or 12 regular customers. Two of the men were friends of my father and were playing shuffleboard. I was so embarrassed to go inside and I stood outside the window practicing how to ask for what I was supposed to get. When I finally got up the nerve and slunk into the adult's domain, everything went quiet as I walked head down to the short end of the bar, the identical spot I was to kill a man 12 years later. Hey. You're one of the Sullivan kids, ain't you? The bartender, Phil Rubin, asked. Yes, sir, I replied. My mother told me to come here. She said you had something for her. I was relieved to get the words out. Huh? I don't know. Oh, yeah. The beer container on the other end of the bar. Ain't much, kid. Some of the guys been dipping into it for the jukebox and phone calls. He laughed. And that was the first time I ever entertained the thought of killing another human being. Are these my father's friends, I thought, fighting back the tears as I stepped on the rung of the bar stool to reach the court cardboard beer container the collection was taken upon. It said Sullivan Kids on it. Hey, kid! One of the drunks grabbed my arm, almost causing me to spill the container. Where's your mother? Ain't seen it for a while. Tell her to come around and have a few drinks with us. He said with a suggestive wink I did not fail to get the meaning of. I went cold, just staring at him. Beginning to cry but not knowing why, I ran out of the bar. Take out? No, Mom, I wouldn't. Excuse me, I'll come back. Twenty-four dollars? Mom exclaimed drunkenly. You take anything out here? She slurred as I stood before her, looking at the little stacks of quarters, dimes, nickels, and even pennies she had counted out. Take out? No, Mom, I wouldn't. Kneel down, Joe, she ordered me. All I could think of was Aunt Seal. Please, no more of that, I whimpered. Kneel down, she shouted, reaching for an old 8 by 10 photo of my dad which she held in her lap, facing me as, I, as she slouched back on the couch. I knelt down with my head lowered, beginning to cry in confusion. Tell him you didn't mean it, Mom hiccuped again. Mean what, Mom? I begged pitifully. Please, Joseph. She always used my given name when she was angry or annoyed. You know he was sick before he went to the hospital. If you had been a good son, he would have lived. You killed him with your selfishness, Joseph. 
Now pray and ask him for his forgiveness. Don't look away, damn it. Look at his face, you bastard. Please, mom, I didn't hurt him. I didn't kill him, I cried uncontrollably. Look up at him, she screamed, clenching her fingers cruelly in my hair and jerking my head up to look at the picture of the face I had worshipped. Say it, she screamed again, slapping me back and forth across the face as I cried out in unison to the blows. I'm sorry, forgive me, Dad, I'm sorry, I choked brokenly and repeated till Mom fell back against the couch with an exhausted breath and finally fell asleep in a drunken stupor. This was a scene that would be repeated night after night for months till I finally, till I finally began to believe her monstrous accusations. During the day, she was all right, just short-tempered and mean, and never once mentioned the nightly episodes. <clears throat> Did she even remember them? This went on until one day she asked me, honey, get a bottle of beer from the refrigerator. I knew she was getting an early start and couldn't take any more. I decided to run away from home, though not without a sense of guilt at leaving my brothers and sisters behind. I later learned that she never accused or abused them in the manner she did me, but made their lives hell in numerous other ways. Running away from home in those days brought the serious charge of being a truant. I was eventually sent to the New York State Training School for Boys, a reform school for juvenile delinquents in Warwick, New York. I was a very bitter and naive young man, one who had learned the harsh realities of life slowly, but ever so surely. I'd learned that the world was a lonely place and people were not always nice. I learned that I had to act like a man and fight like a man before I had mentally or physically become a man. That, or become a human punching bag for, very, for every emotionally disturbed kid worse off than myself who came down the pike. Thankfully, at that stage of my life, I had a good rabbi, trainer, and corner man, and a huge, loving, emphatically black woman named Mrs. Ransom, who was not only the house mother, but also the high sheriff of B2 Cottage in Warwick, and nobody fucked with her. Warwick, 1953, New York State Training School for Boys. I was on the lawn mowing gang most of the time I was in Warwick when I wasn't again running away. I was really out of my environment and felt like a Cheerio in a bowl of Rice Krispies being in Cottage B2, where 90% of the kids were black, as were the cottage parents, Mr. and Mrs. Ransom. Mrs. Ransom looked like a big African queen, close to six feet tall and pushing 200 pounds, and none of it was loose. It all belonged there. She was an awesome sight, even when she was angry. But I remember her fondness, because it, if it wasn't for her, I would have been. But I remember her fondness because if it wasn't for her, I would have had those wild ghetto trained kids kicking my ass 24 7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. These kids didn't need a reason to punch you out. It seemed whenever they felt bored or wanted to get their shit off, they would pass up 50 dudes to get to the local punching bag, me. I guess besides my being white, they instinctively sensed here was a cracker, all soft and creamy on the inside, an easy mark and victim. I can laugh when I look back on it now, but I don't think I smiled five times the whole time I was there. On one particularly bad day, I came back from mowing grass with two black eyes and a busted lower lip. While trying to sneak past Mrs. Ransom into the house, she grabbed me by my arm and pulled me into the kitchen and spun me around to face her. Look at me, boy, she whispered. I was too ashamed to lift my chin off my chest. Look at me, boy, she yelled, shaking me by both shoulders until I thought my neck would pop off. I looked up and felt more ashamed to see the tears running down her cheeks. What you gonna do, boy? This shit has got to stop, she said with unfelt gruffness. I don't know, I muttered, feeling sorry for myself. Are you afraid to fight, she asked. 
Are you a pussy boy? No, I muttered defensively. Well, then you gonna learn to fight, boy. I know it was that Scott boy that whipped you upon your ass again. You're gonna go in that dorm and whip whip up on him. And if you don't, you don't never talk with me again. You hear me, boy? She yeasted me up, rubbing my shoulders like she was my corner man in a championship fight. You want a stick or something? No, ma'am. I was scared to death, but more of her fury than Scott. Well, get on out there, she ordered with the raised arm, finger pointing majestically, sending her frightened knight into battle. As I walked out of the kitchen, my eyes darting about wildly for escape, I noticed the doors were already locked for the night. As I walked down the corridor toward the dormitory, I could see the guys there. There were 52 boys in the dorm, getting ready for bed and lights out. I'll go into the bathroom here and pretend I'm taking a crap. She couldn't blame me for that. I got bad cramps in my stomach and have to go anyway. Besides, I can fight with Scott in the morning. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I was sitting on the bowl for about 20 minutes and was almost asleep when I heard a heavy knock on the door. I felt I was going to shit all over myself because if it was one of the guys, he'd just walk in. Who is it? I croaked weakly. Are you in there, Joseph? She growled. Joseph? I shuddered. I'm coming, Miss Ransom. I squeaked, pulling my pants up. I had no need to wipe my ass. Now, don't you mind, because I'm coming in. And with that, the door bust open, and in flew my tormentor, the Scott kid, looking more scared than me. He wasn't cool at all. And seeing him like this, he somehow didn't look as big or mean to me anymore. Mrs. Ransom stepped inside smiling and standing with her back against the door exclaimed, all right, fight you little bastards. And I wants to see a good one, she barked. We both flew at each other on command. And while we were punching the shit out of each other, I felt good. I felt proud. And even when both of us were so lumped up and exhausted, she pushed us on screaming, y'all ain't finished yet. Don't hang on to each other, you little sissies. I don't like that wrestling shit. Fight! Mr. Ransom was banging on the door with his cane. Mary, you let them boys on out here. That's enough, he commanded. You hear me, Mary? Mind your business, Pa, and get on away from here, she growled through the door at him. All right, but enough is enough, Mary, he said quietly and went away. Shit, we were all through anyway. I was lying under the sink. He was lying under the pisser. Excuse me. I was lying under the sink. He was lying half in the pisser, both of us warily watching each other, gasping and licking our wounds, each of us hoping the other didn't want any more action. Mrs. Ransom could have screamed, fight, for the rest of the night, but neither of us was about to move. She left the bathroom and a few minutes later came back with her pajamas, towels, soap, etc. All right, boys said she ever so gently. You take a nice warm shower, and when you're finished, come to my apartment, okay? Yes, ma'am, I said. Me too, said Scott. Me too what? She scowled darkly. Oh, shit, I thought. Me too, yes, ma'am, ma'am, he ventured quickly. Mrs. Ransom laughed thunderously and left us to shower. We showered cautiously, still eyeing each other warily. After a few minutes, Scott muttered, damn, that crazy bitch would have let us kill each other if we didn't stop, huh? Yeah, man. I agreed happily with the growing sense of pride and accomplishment, feeling more like a co-conspirator with him. What's she want us to come to apartment for? She gonna fuck with us some more? Man, my fucking back's killing me, he groaned. Afterwards, Mrs. Ransom greeted us with two big bowls of ice cream and told us to get our asses into bed, and if we felt like fighting again, to come see her. The next morning, when I woke up, every bone in my body was hurting, but I felt 
like a different person. <laughs> I felt puffed up with pride and felt like fighting again just to see if that rumble in that shit house was really me. When I walked into the kitchen after chow, Mrs. Ransom winked knowingly at me and I grinned at her from ear to ear, silently thanking and loving her for what she did. About a week later, she asked if I would like to go fishing with her out on the lake. I gratefully accepted. She made sandwiches and, and big thermos and lemonade. It was a beautiful sunny day with a light cool breeze blowing across the lake. Mrs. Ransom carried on like a young girl every time she thought something was biting. Oh, oh, I can feel it. It's a monster. And then she it. The son of a bitch jumped off my hook again. Needless to say, neither one of us caught any fish that day, but it didn't matter. The lemonade was cold and the sandwiches were delicious. And we both had a great time. And I was rowing back to shore. As I was rowing back to shore, she told me to pull the oars in and rest a while. Your hands hurting, boy? She asked, catching me licking the blisters on my palms. No, nah, they're all right, I answered bravely as she laughed happily and leaned toward me, messing with my hair fondly. You're going to be all right, boy. You're going to be all right. Don't you feel better now that you fought that boy? Don't you feel better to be able to hold your head up high? Yes, ma'am, I whispered, feeling contented as she scratched lightly behind my ear. I wish I could stay in this boat for the rest of my life, but I knew this wasn't possible. I basked under and drew forth every small gesture of affection I could manage until she laughed knowingly and pushed my head away, chuckling. I'm going to spoil you, boy, she said wistfully. She then sat up to her full height and pointed to shore, commanding me with a smile. Row, and I rowed, blisters and all, never feeling a thing. Everything was going fine for a while. It seemed to be the... F seemed to be fighting, excuse me, everything was going well for a, let's start over, everything was going fine for a while, I seemed to be fighting every other day now, still coming back to the cottage with black eyes and busted lips, but I was beginning to give up more than I got, until things got so bad, I could only get about one fight a week, I learned that most dudes don't really, wa don't really want a real fight, they pick their shots, and shy away from anyone they feel might put something on their ass. These are the same cats that will jap you three steps away from the man. They figure if they don't knock you out or break your jaw, the man will break it up and before you get a chance to retaliate. The dudes who can really thump and don't mind bringing their lunch with them don't resort to these different types of punk-like tactics since they possess the heart of a prolonged affair and can take as much as they give. The few times I've been offered into a shit house or in the back of a tier in a cell block, I knew instinctively that this dude was a man and he sure enough wanted to fight. But there is not too much of this because after a while, like in anything else in life, a certain closeness develops, a certain respect for those others who share the same principles you yourself live by as a man. I have found that everyone respects a man, black or white. When I was transferred from Mrs. Ransom's cottage a few months later for fighting, I just started running away again, only to be brought back and tried by the inmate kangaroo court made up of the cottage's top-notch little sadists. When a guy ran away, the whole cottage would lose credits, etc thus reducing their chance for monthly visit for a monthly visit home i was never acquitted always convicted and the penalty never changing a kangaroo court ass whipping i finally made it to new york city on my seventh try a friend of mine who turned out to be a bona fide stool pigeon and i took off one night running through woods and swamps for about 5 miles i had to half carry this prick most of the way and at one point had to pull him out of what appeared to be quicksand because he was waist deep in shit on the first contact. 
He squealed like a pig and started crying even before he could possibly have known what had happened. I spun around and my first reaction was to laugh because it was dark and all I could see was his body from the waist up sticking out of the ground. I think I'm in quicksand, he squeaked pitifully. I remember waiting a few minutes, expecting him to disappear like in the movies. Plop, all of a sudden, please, Sully, help me. I was about 10 yards away from him and I suddenly became very conscious of the ground and I was stand that I was standing on. Damn. Tried to help him. All right, take it easy, Tommy. I rasped, getting down on all fours, inching my way toward him, stretching one out, one arm out in front of me of the other, pressing easily as I went until my hand hit some type of shit that did not want to stay beneath it. Come on, Sully, pull me out, huh? Yeah, yeah, take it easy, will you? I was becoming shaky now because it was moving almost to his chest. Take it easy. I feel it moving. Do something, please. What can I do, I thought desperately, searching the woods around me with my eyes for a stick, a branch of some sort. There was none. Sully, he screamed frantically, his hand reaching out in desperation. He was at least seven yards away. I sure wasn't going to step into that shit. Use your belt. He was whimpering now. Damn, why didn't I think of that? Quickly, I pulled off my shirt and pants and tied them together tightly along my canvas tight belt that we were issued. All right, Tommy, I'm going to throw it to you. Don't pull on it. I'll do the pulling, okay? Because the pants might rip. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, right. He stuttered. Hurry up, huh? I lay on my stomach with my right arm down at my side behind me. My left extended palm down on the ground for balance. I whipped it suddenly over my head, too short, but just a little. Shit, Sully, damn, hurry up, throw it again, huh? Take it easy, Tommy, stop moving so much, I said. It was almost to his armpits, I threw it again. I, I got it, I got it, Sully. Don't pull, you fucking dope, just hang on to it. All right, Sully, he choked. I never thought I would ever get him out, but after about an hour of pulling, he was completely free, gasping and choking and puking his guts out. We eventually slid into our mud-caked clothes and continued on our way. After that, every hundred yards we walked, I had to listen to his whining about going back, but was dissuaded each time when I told him I would kick his ass. We finally came out of the woods on the edge of some small town. I figured it was about three in the morning. You sure you know how to jump the wires? I asked as we approached some parked car on a dark street. Yeah, I told you I used to do it every day. There's nothing to it. All right, which one are we going to take? Let's get that one. It was a 49 Ford. He was under the hood only a matter of a few seconds and was finished. I was very impressed. What a genius, I thought. Don't slam the hood or they'll hear it in the house. He eased it down until it was closed but not locked. We slammed it shut a few blocks away. We got to New York City with no trouble, and four hours later, we were caught. Since we were outside the car when we were caught, he wasted no time putting the finger on me. He said I forced him to run away. I jumped the wires, and I drove the car. His mother, father, aunts, and uncles swore to it. Their good word and about 2,500 got him out, but not before I broke the rat bastard's nose and got a few teeth. The Judas bastard. <laughs> I got three years in Elmira Reformatory for not having someone who would pay $2,500 for me. I had just turned 16 three days before. I didn't know how to drive a car then. I was in jail for over 25 years before I got my license at the age of 38. Attica, 1971, 9.15 a.m. My heart jumped and my eyes flew open as I heard the distant motor of what sounded like a truck. It was, and it was coming out of, from the garage and around in the direction of the school. Mike was still poised on the platform watching the rear gate intently. Lenny was just sitting outside the back door of the powerhouse, casually smoking a cigarette. 
but I knew he was watching me from the corner of his eye with anxiety, waiting for my move. The blue denim shirt and dungarees I had changed into were soaked with sweat and clung coldly under my arms. I smiled with my eyes. I smiled when my eyes fell to the tin badge on my chest. Charlie had really outdone himself when he worked these things into shape. The one on what appeared to be an officer's hat was even better, almost to perfection. Not bad for tin cans. I told him not to kill himself working on them because if I had to come in range for a close inspection, I'd be dead anyway. Listen, Sully, I don't know what you're doing. I don't want to know. It's better that way, understand? If something goes wrong, I want to be above any suspicion. I like our friendship too much for that. I understand, Charlie, but be cool, huh? I said in mock terror, putting my hand over my heart. Don't worry, Sully, he grinned. I hope you get these creep bastards. God, I hope you get them. Me too, Charlie. 9.16 a.m. I can't look up at the tower once I get out there next to the wall because I swear he's looking at me or about to turn around, even if he isn't. I'd use it as an excuse for myself. You've got to rely on, on their habits. Why shouldn't they watch the trucks today? Why should they act differently? Damn, if the wall wasn't so high, just a little shorter, just a few feet shorter. My fucking eyes feel like they're on fire. I just close my eyes and rest for a second. Kaksaki, 1955. Abuse is the weapon of cowards. Those who apply it know this fact, as well as those who have to accept it. After three months in Elmira Reception Center, where I was labeled number 13316, I was sent to Kaksaki Reformatory, Bop City, number 10192, to do my time, zip three. This fucking place destroyed any sense of feeling I had in me for quite some time to come. It was a racist institution because it kept that way by a sick administration. Excuse me. It was a racist institution because it was kept that way by a sick inst administration. Their philosophy was that as long as they can keep blacks and whites at each other's throats, stabbing, fighting, and fucking one another like animals, they knew we would never have the time to wonder why certain things were as they were or who our real enemies were. That's real shit. The yard itself was a sick kind of joke. It was divided into sections, black, white, and Puerto Rican, and in each turn divided their own into three categories in different manners. The whites had the G's, or good boys as they were called, half asses and creeps. The G's were supposedly the elite of the white fighting force, though probably almost half either knew someone from the street or paid five or 10 cartons of cigarettes from the distinct, for the distinguished honor of standing with the G's. There were, there were really only a handful of dudes who could really thump, fight. The rest were phonies and were getting a free ride through the joint on their reputation. Well, anyway, these guys had the larger portion of real estate, the wall, and in the yard with maybe a dozen guys owning or running a portion of about five to 10 yards apiece. These were white lines on, yeah, these were white lines on the walls themselves. And on the ground about 10 yards from the wall, sectioning off each individual's property or pads as they were called. Anywhere from five to 20 guys stood in these pads and it was their duty to go up the fight. Any dude who crossed the line unless he had permission from the pad owner to do so. At one time it was G's policy that anyone who wanted to stand with them had to go up on a shine, black person, to prove their courage. And much of them did, usually by japping the dude when he wasn't looking. This policy was abandoned when some guy found that the guards were too slow in getting there. The G's were allowed to talk to half-assed guys who in reality were tougher dudes than the good boys, but not for too long. And they were not permitted to speak to a so-called creep at all. That was immediate expulsion. Number 
The half-assed guys had the same setup as the G's, but didn't have the illustrious history to go with it. The creeps had no wall to lean against and no place to sit. They stood in the middle of the yard, which was no bigger than a football field. When they got bored standing still, all they could do was keep walking in circles, even in the winter when all the snow was pushed out in the middle of the yard. It really hurt me to look at them on the really bitter cold days. No wall to protect them from the cutting winds or galoshes to protect their feet when the snow piles they stood in began to thaw. We didn't have to go through this because we shoveled all our snow onto them. In reality, we treated ourselves with more disrespect as human beings than the cops did. But it was a result of what, what they and their fathers created for years. The infamous Captain Follett, Pegleg Follett, was God in this joint while I was there. He later became warden of Greenhaven. The prick died about two years ago, 16 years too late as far as my life and that of many others are concerned. Follett's idea of punishment for minor infractions was to take your eyeglasses, glass eye, crutches, beds, etc., for three or four months, or 30 days bread and water with only one meal every third day. For serious offenses like a bad, bad fist fight, you were automatically beaten up with clubs from the place the fight took place to the box up in A3. There, surrounded by eight or 10 officers, you were made to strip if you were still conscious, get down on all fours and bark, meow, or moo according to what type of animal Captain Follett desired to hear. When they all tired of this, everyone that was in the box would be told to get up on their doors and watch another get their G's slid by. They didn't want you to simply crawl on your hands and knees. They were, you were beaten until you got on your belly and pulled yourself along the floor with your hands and forearms while they continued to beat you across the back and legs. If you didn't scream, I'm a punk, a faggot, and a motherfucker, for everyone to hear, they'd feel cheated and in indignant. This is the point where many kids, 16 or 17 years old, could get their heads split open, crying not from the pain, but from the unbelievable humiliation. I was in the box on a number of occasions when this took place and cried like a baby every time I was forced to watch. If you didn't watch, you were forced to join them out there. The kids that were really hurt seriously were sent to Matawan State Mental Hospital. This was Matawan in the 50s, where they were killing dozens of guys a year or more. Their excuse, you either cracked up or had a terrible fall. So Matawan State Prison, actually, that's where uh, a lot of the father was sent. And uh, that's where uh, 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 this guy named Azriel, a man named John Kennedy, who became one of the early five percenters, uh, first met a lot of the father, who was the creator uh, or innovator, if you will, or prophet of five percenters, right? A lot of the father, who a lot be uh, knew when when he was young and 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 you know learned under. Um, and actually, when I visited Joe Sullivan in prison with the lobby, it was actually, um, I think it was called Fishkill, and Fishkill was Matawan. Like, Matawan, I could be mistaken, tell me in the comments, but uh, from what Alibi was telling me, Matawan was on one part of the property and Fishkill on the other. So Sullivan was sent back there, you know? Continuing. The same low-life captains, lieutenants, and sergeants of 15 years ago are now the diplomatic wardens of our prison system. Out of that one sadistic crew at Kaksaki, three are wardens today, Captain Follett, Captain Laval, and Sergeant Fritz. I would bet that they are proud, and their families are proud, are proud of how they worked their way to the top.
My God, how they worked. Around March 1958, many of the guys who had been in Coxsackie for two years or more were shipped out because the administration felt they were a bad example for the new Jacks, together with the fact that we owned pads in the yard. About 200 guys were shipped out to different places, Auburn, Greenhaven, Attica, etc. cetera. Napanuck, 1958, age 19. Six other guys and myself were sent to Nap Napanuck, a joint for retard criminals, they used to say for slower men. Most of them had, quote, one day to life sentences for bullshit beefs. But these cats were really insane. They had all kinds of bugs there, you name it. They told us that when we got there, that they were changing the place into a regular reformatory and that we just happened to be the first shipment of regular guys to come. A lot of these sick bastards were asshole bandits and just loved young kids. My friend Hurley, a black dude, knocked one out cold and we weren't in the joint an hour yet. We quickly forgot our cocksocky prejudices and agreed that we would stick together in this joint at least until others came and the joint got normal. Because frankly, 90% of these guys, white and black, were, weren't playing with a full deck. I was assigned to a machine shop and wasn't there a half hour when this dude slid up on me. Obviously, these guys thought we were green and came right up off the streets. And he came up with the works, candy bars, magazines, etc. Usually, if a cat accepted, well, that was it. Get ready to wear a skirt. I was really smoking mad and just smiled when he gave it to me. I even thanked him. I was not only going to take his shit needed, too. I planned to take his fucking life. I probably could have got this dude with my hands, but I wanted to kill him. He was a happy cocksucker, just grinning and winking at me. I could see all those other vultures in the shop just waiting to see where I was. This dude slid over to me and whispered, Dig, baby, you want to come out back and help me shovel the platform? Yeah, all right, I said innocently. You go on out, and I got to put my galoshes and stuff, okay? I got to put on my galoshes and stuff, okay? Sure, baby, his confidence and anxiety mounting. I'll get the shovels. As soon as the door shut behind him, I went to my locker and put on my jacket. There were pieces of pipe lying all over the shop, all solid steel in different sizes. I grabbed one about a foot long and stuck it in my belt beneath my jacket. I had never hit anyone with a weapon like this before, and I really didn't give it too much thought because it was no more than this hand called for. I walked out of the shop and into the carpenter shop, pausing momentarily to look out the window. He was at the far end of the platform, shoveling off the heavy drifts that began to pile up. Still facing the window, I took my jacket off and brought it in front of me, sliding the pipe out and into the jacket. I tucked it under my left arm and stepped out the door onto the platform. He made it easy for me because he had on some kind of cloth earmuffs, never heard me walk up on him until I spoke. Hey, I called in a normal tone. When he spun his head, he still never got the chance for it to register who or what hit him. I drove the pipe down his head with terrible hatred, and my whole face seemed to burst open before my eyes. Excuse me. And his whole face seemed to burst open before my eyes. His body hit the snowdrift with a soft thud, and he didn't move. In a matter of seconds, it seemed that the whole platform was red. I threw the pipe into the snowbank alongside the building and walked back inside. He was still in the hospital when I went home five months later. I was 19 years old. 1958, 19 years old. This was indeed a strange world to me. People smiled at you only with the outer surface of their beings expecting me to do the same to get along in the world. Inside, I had learned what was expected of me and what to expect. Out in the world, things were moving too fast for me. 
Go to work. Get that dollar. Get that dollar. That's all that counts in this life. Fuck that dollar is what I felt after blowing three jobs in a period of eight days. All three were factory jobs. And besides the fact that I couldn't stand being inside, the bastards wanted my fucking soul for $50 a week, sleeping full floors and folding boxes, etc. On this one job, I had to clean the bathroom at the end of the day, and I felt so embarrassed that I would lock myself in the maintenance room until I, had, I knew all the young girls had left. Only then, I slid out of the room with my mops, pail, and toilet brush. I was doing all right, though. I felt proud that I was working four days already. A record. I was cleaning the shit bowls with the toilet brush when the foreman came in. A small, weaselly type of man who had been exerting his authority on me since I started, but somehow I managed a smile on each occasion figuring he'd see I wasn't a wise guy and lighten up on me. What I didn't know until some time later was that this guy knew I had done time and didn't feel I had a right to work amongst good normal people. I guess he took it upon himself to play St. George and, the, and slay the dragon. What are you doing, Sullivan? He asked with his forearms, with his foreman's voice, standing over me while I was on one knee. This rotten fucking creep. What am I doing? Why I'm taking this crap for $50 a week? Why am I taking this crap for $50 a week? Fuck the pay. Why am I taking it all? I smiled inwardly, having reached my decision. Fuck it. Let me see just how this guy would push me, even if I did try to be nice. I'm cleaning the toilet bowls, Mr. Carlton, I said nicely. I can see that, he snapped. How the hell do you ever expect to get them clean with that thing? He pointed to the toilet brush in my hand. They don't look bad, and besides, I'm doing the best I can on them. I could see his sick fucking mind working, and yep, he went over to the cabinet, where the steel wool and lava soap were kept. Now, mister, we'll get them like they should be. Just rub a little of this on it and use some elbow grease, kid. He extended the stuff toward me, and I felt like I was going to faint from the burning anger and humiliation. My mind, my head was pounding, and every muscle in my body was coiled, but I was still smiling. I never did it that way before, Mr. Carlton. Show me how it's done, I whispered viciously with all the venom and contempt I felt for him. What? He stuttered. Who do you think you're talking to? At the same time, he was looking over his shoulder to see if the door was still in the same place. I jumped between him and the door. What's wrong with you? He quivered, his eyes getting as big as saucers. I threw the steel wool at his feet. You're what's wrong with me, tough guy. Now get the shit bowl, I screamed. Get in what? How? He whimpered. Get in there, just like you wanted me to get in there, I said. No, I wouldn't do it. I, bang, I caught him right on the point of his chin, and he went down like a shot. The second he hit the floor, he was scurrying on his hands and knees for the shit bowls. Which one? He gasped, looking at me horrified. I remembered seeing a wedding band on his finger and asked him, what would your wife think of this, mister? This ripped him apart, and great racking sobs tore loose from his deep in, excuse me, this ripped him apart, and great racking sobs tore loose from deep inside him. With all this, my anger subsided, and I truly felt a deep pity for him and disgust with myself for allowing him to bring me to such a level because his shame was also my own. I walked over to him. I wanted him to get up and hit me. At least it would justify my action a little bit. He just sat there quietly, his body convulsing as if in great physical pain. I'm sorry, Mr. Carlton, I offered pitifully. Th that's, that's all right, he managed to get out, wheezingly. You were right, he said. I understood that he felt he deserved this, but he didn't. Yes, he tried to humiliate me, but the difference was 
I could have walked away from him, even quit as I planned to do in, in any event, but I didn't give him a chance to walk away with his dignity. No, I, I wasn't right, Mr. Carlton. I said more to myself than to him. I would like my four days pay in the morning, if that's all right. I couldn't even look at him. Yes, of course, he said quietly, not in fear, but in the voice of a person he really was, not the voice of a petty tyrant foreman or of the job he had become, but of a basically good man. I knew this, but at 19, I didn't want to believe there were good people. Maybe this way of thinking made me sleep easier at night. I don't know. About three days after this incident, I got a phone call from my boyhood friend named Blackie. My mother and sister implored me not to meet him since they felt he was a great deal of influence over my younger years. Excuse me. My mother and sister employed me not to meet him since they felt he had a great deal of influence over my younger years, which he did. I just brushed it aside, saying something like I was 19 years old now and that he didn't do my thinking for me, so I thought. I met him that night in a bar after not seeing him for about five years. He was only two years older than myself, but already looked like he was in his early 30s. I had a beer with him, and eventually he gave me the pitch. He had just come out of Bellevue after a 30-day drying up period from alcohol. I found out later that he was using drugs. Since they didn't usually mix, I figured he had been kicking a habit and still looked strung out at the time. He went on to tell me that he was facing two charges for sale of heroin. What do you want? What do you want to see me for, Blackie? I asked suspiciously, but still the sucker. Damn, Sully, we've been friends since we were kids. You're the only friend I got. When you were up there in Coxsackie, I wrote you, didn't? Didn't you get my letters? I even tried to get it, but they wouldn't let me. Did you think I forgot about you? He asked, looking hurt, but I, I didn't even think such a thing. I never got no letters, Blackie. I never heard nothing about you trying to visit. You know how they are, Sully, he said. He knew all my weak spots. Yeah, I guess so, I said, starting to go on the defensive, feeling I owed him a great debt. What'd you want from me, Blackie? I didn't want nothing, Sully. I just wanted you to come with me. Go with you where? What for? I thought of my mother and sister and how hurt they would feel if they could see I was allowing him to, what I was, excuse me. I thought of my mother and sister and how hurt they could feel if they could see what I was allowing him to do. Puerto Rico, out west, anywhere. I'll get a lot of time if I stay in New York. You got to go with me, Sully. I don't want to go by myself. This was the first time I had ever seen the weak side of him, and I felt uncomfortable seeing him in this position. I ain't got no money, clothes, nothing. How are we going to travel anywhere, I finished. He laughed and waved it aside. Don't worry, he said. I got the bread. You're the same size as me. You can wear my clothes. I was really impressed. Little did I know the suit on his back was the only one he owned, and it was stolen. When did you want to leave, Blackie? I asked anxiously with visitors, with visions of Texas ranches and rodeos dancing in my head. Tomorrow morning, come over to my house, and we'll leave from there, okay? All right, and with that, we'll leave this reading of uh, Joe Sullivan's Tears and Tears. At that, we'll leave it there. That's uh, the early years. Uh, long before he became the mob hitman. Um, interesting book, interesting life. And as Sullivan said, it's, it was something that he, he was not proud of at all. And, but at least he documented it and in writing it, perhaps people can learn, learn from it. So, all right, we'll, uh, we'll pick up on more uh, Joe Sullivan tears and tears at a later date. Prop and on. peace out. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay. Okay. Okay. Okay. Okay. Okay.